Welcome to Club Class, the radio show made specifically for anyone that happens to be listening to it at the moment. <laughs> One of the duties of doing this job is I've sometimes got to do odd little things on the radio that I wouldn't normally do in a comedy show, so I've got to quickly do the shipping forecast for tonight now. <laughs> so uh, are we ready? Everyone out there shipping, listen, this is tonight's shipping forecast. I reckon there's going to be a lot of ships out there. <laughs> That's, I like that one, but you know, it's not, obviously not true. Probably the most famous show on, on English radio at the moment is Desert Island Disc. Anyone listen to that? Yeah. yeah it, it, the vast majority of the world doesn't. Only two people in the, in the Zap Club do. And they're lying anyway. But, <laughs> but for, for the people that don't, what happens is Desert Island Disc, you get on these people that are supposed to be great thinkers and politicians, and, and they choose the eight records that you take with you if you went to a desert island like you're going to have that choice before you go to a desert island. The last thing you think of is, oh, well, we've had the records. What records am I going to take? And they always choose pretty much the same thing. They choose something like um, a 17th century madrigal to look intelligent. And they choose like a Cliff Richard record for the kids. And then they choose um, something like stand up Christian soldiers or whatever it's called for the religion. But anyway, they always choose the s pretty much the same records. And at the end of the show, they're allowed a, a luxury item to take away with them to this desert island. And I've listened to it week in, week out, and not one of them's chosen a record player yet. <laughs> that was rough, wasn't it? <laughs> anyway, time, it's time now for tonight's start. And um, uh, what can I say about him that isn't written on this piece of paper? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all, so I'll just read it out. He's a previous winner of the prestigious Time Out Cabaret Award, and he's been seen on telly on Friday Night Live, Paramount City, and on radio on Mary Whitehouse Experience, and his own show, The Mix, on Radio 5. So, everyone ready with the applause? Yes, yes here he is, Mark Thomas! I'm actually going to tell you a story tonight. And, as some of you might know, I'm a stand-up comic. That's the house of I'm living. And there are major differences. Uh, obvious differences really in, in stand-up and, and storytelling. Uh, one's a narrative structure and the other one obviously you have to get a laugh every 30 seconds. So um, if this was actually a stand-up gig, like I'd be dying by now. But he hecklers would be in the toilets sort of warming up and gargling. This is a story so it isn't true. Right, we heard, we heard a bit about truth, but it isn't true because, like, all stories get exaggerated and you tell them, you tell a tale, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it just gets completely divorced from the truth and you end up with things like, on the first day he created the planets and the skies and the earth and the seas and, and what he probably actually did was put up a set of shelves. <laughs> probably what actually happened. And, uh, I, actually, I actually reckon the, cru the crucifixion is a pub story. It's, like, it's got all the classic hallmarks of a pub story. <laughs> Because it starts at closing time, right? Two blokes in a garden kissing each other. I love you like a brother. I love you like a brother. I really do. I love you. Then it all goes horribly wrong. Crucified. Such a bad hangover. Doesn't get up for three days. <laughs> Blimey, where'd these bruises on my hand and feet come from? <laughs> so this isn't, this isn't true, all right? This isn't true. Um, I should also say that there are bits in the stories which are complete lies. It's just got nothing to do with the truth whatsoever. There, there's a bit in the story where one of the characters eats his own genitals, right? And I want you to know that this is a lie. Okay. I want you to know this is a lie. I mean, you, it's obviously a lie. I mean, anyone with basic CSE cookery will spot the inconsistencies on this one. Because um, you just don't use oregano like that. You know? So anyway, the story, this is the story. The first person in the story that you're going to meet is a guy called Trent. Right now, playwrights and storytellers, they often use names that will show the character of, of, of an individual by the name. Now, I can't emphasise how much of a Trent Trent really is. <laughs> right. um, parents who believed that um, American 60s detective um, characters, uh, especially the actual detectives themselves, uh, were role models for their children but wouldn't buy their children chopper bikes because they weren't sensible enough. <laughs> they called their children Trent. Trents generally uh, lose their virginity at the age of 15 to maniac aunties who are drenched in creme de menthe and divorce suits and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, it's all tacky and horrible and the social workers called in and everything. Um, they also, Trents only have one true friend 
and they're normally two or three years older than them, they collect wasps and commit suicide in remand centres. So, <laughs> now this particular Trent lives on a religious commune and on the morning that the story starts, which is four days before he actually dies, um, if, you actually, if, you, if you listen to the beginning you might have jumped because Trent is actually the one who does it. Trent consumes himself. He's the boy, okay? Um, so, but it, and on the death certificate, it actually says food poisoning. <laughs> but Trent is the guy who does it. On this particular day, Trent wakes up, he's stood in his cell, and it's a religious commune, standing in the cell, and says, wash. He goes into the communal washrooms. Now, washing with radical Christians is a religious experience. There are chants, there are songs, there's all sorts of stuff to do. If you stand outside the door while he's doing his hands and face, you'll get, um, let me be an armour light and for the Lord I will fight. A dum-dum bullet I will be for the Holy Trinity. <laughs> so, you know, by the time he's fully washed and dressed, he's gone nuclear for Jesus. <laughs> um, but Trent is a boy, he's a boy with problems, because it's not that he actually has any, any, any doubts, it's that he just has problems fitting in. Like, um, Trent has to go with his fellow disciples, they have to go and convert people. So he's in a pub in the West End trying to convert some students. And one of the students sort of says, look, I have a bit of a problem with the concept of a virgin birth. Trent immediately jumps up, what's this? What's this? You calling our Mary a slag? Eh? <laughs> so Trent is in a bit of a state. He, he gets called to the battle committee room where the, where the leadership meet him. Now the leadership, there's 12 central leaders. They sit around on a big table. Right, and they all sit behind the table. It's like Pol Pot's hijacked the Last Supper, okay? They're all sitting there in their army fatigues. And the leader, Paul, Brother Paul, looks up at Trent and says, Trent, don't think we don't appreciate your efforts. And before I let you know the outcome of our decision, I would like to say that we are pleased with your work. And God is pleased with your work. And we feel, well, God feels, perhaps you would be better suited away from the front line of the war. Maybe a job in an administrative capacity? Now Trent looks up and with tears he says, Could you ask God to give me one more chance? I am his soldier. I'm a man for God. Please, I, I want to take the battle to, to Satan. I want to fight him on his home ground. I just need a group of people and we'll actually go to fight the devil. Now, the committee are a little bit taken aback about this because dissent doesn't normally happen, especially with small religious groups. Right? People want to leave small religious groups, they suddenly have a spate of industrial accidents. <laughs> Oops, he went into the lathe, and on the day we told him to wear the kipper tie and work a 15-hour shift. <laughs> so, Trent's request is really sort of taking them aback. They look up and say, where do you want? Where, where, where do you want to go to take this, this fight to, to the devil? And he says, the Glastonbury Festival. <laughs> now the festival site, okay, the festival site, 24 hours before the official start of the event. Okay, people are coming from all over the country. The, the convoy arrives on Monday before the weekend, okay, before it actually starts. The convoy arrived, 218 buses, vans and coaches, one school bus, 28 mobile windmills, 200 weight of, of sulfate, grass, hash, acid, coke, a quantity of magic mushrooms that can only be measured in bales, right? <laughs> 17 PAs, there's five documentary filmmakers and three sociology students with them. <laughs> By Wednesday, they've set up their own bar with a TV in it, okay? Because although it's anarcho-pastoralism, Neighbours still has a role to play. <laughs> And as a festival, any festival abandons laws. And Glastonbury is no exception. There are laws that are just completely left, like fashion. <laughs> there are no laws concerning fashion in Glastonbury. You might, if you go to the Glastonbury Festival, you will wake up on Monday morning on the way to work going, now why did I find that Afghan's tribesman hat attractive? <laughs> why did I buy that yellow scarf with Vishnu on it? What happened? And it will completely elude you until you get back to the festival next year when for three days you will find its beauty again. <laughs> for three days. Every year, anarchy A's tattooed on people's shoulders look attractive. For three days. 
For three days, I want an anarchy A on my shoulder. It's like for three days, all the possibilities seem, seem right. The possibilities of, of love and of friendship and of joy and of celebration, the possibilities of living in a world without fear, without hatred, of actually some kind of justice in the world. It all seems possible if you're on acid. <laughs> It seems possible. If you're on acid, you can survive anything at Glastonbury, including the toilets. Which, which, like, thousands and thousands of people going in holes in the ground, it's like a toilet from hell that just screams at you, come here, I want you. <laughs> if you're on acid, you can walk in there, you come out holding a couple of turds, going, look, I found Bilbo and Gandalf, man. <laughs> so the next person I'm going to introduce is a guy called Terry. Now, Terry works um, checking passes at the gate. He checks all the people who are coming into the theatre field to make sure they're supposed to be working there. He comes from a village that's very near the festival site, and he, and he talks a little bit like this. But it's, it's not a stereotype, all right? It's just that my accents are really crap, OK? So, <laughs> festival's all right, see? Um, we do have a bit of a problem with townies and all that, you know, people come from London and all that, because they have a bit of a problem with people in the country. Like, uh, badger baiting, they always have a bit of a shout about that. Yeah, which is not fair, because that's all we've got to do, really. <laughs> yeah, seriously, that's all we do. You so see, you go into the pub, you know everybody in the pub, you've known them since you were a child, you've fought with everybody in the pub, in every possible combination, Harry and Nigel and Jeff and Wilksy, with me holding the pool cue. <laughs> Jeff and Wilksy and me against Harry, while Nigel holds the pool cue. <laughs> Jeff, Nigel, Wilksy, me and everyone against the pool cue. <laughs> we fought with them. We come out of the pub, you're drunk, you say, right, let's have a fight. No, we did that two hours ago. Well, it better be the badgers then, all right. <laughs> in, in, our, in our village, we have a little bit of a joke, okay? Because that's all there is to do, you know. And um, the little bit of a joke is, what do you call a lad who gets his girlfriend pregnant when they're 14? A late developer. <laughs> and uh, that's what they call me. The late developer, just because I never got a girl pregnant, that's what they call it. You know, in every village, in nearly every village, there's somebody who is supposed to sleep with all the animals. That's me. Yeah. The boy who goes hard when the sheep go bah. <laughs> so, uh, I drink quite a lot of home brew now. By myself, you know. So there we are, you've met, met Terry now. There's only a couple more people for you to actually meet. The first group of people are Pete and Judith. Right, they drive down to Glastonbury every year. Pete has had Doc Martens grafted on his feet since his first Rock Against Racism gig in 1978, okay? He's a member of the Labour Party, but recognises the limitation of the structure against mass radical action. <laughs> he is one of about 100 people who go to Glastonbury as a matter of principle, because it's a CND benefit, okay? Like, if, if Leslie Crowther, Ma Kylie Minogue, Paul Daniels, Marty Kane, if they all did a CND benefit, Pete would go. <laughs> at, at Glastonbury, Pete works in a little stall in a tent selling radical literature and posters and badges. Now, Pete lives with Judith. Um, they have sex about once every 10 days, and Pete calls it a sex life. Judith prefers the word coma. That's her favorite <laughs> word. If her friends actually say, how is your sex life with Pete, she will say, stable, but still on the critical list. <laughs> if they asked her, how's your sex life, she'd say, very good, thank you very much. <laughs> because it's a different matter. Her friends might describe her by saying, do the words lapsed Catholic mean anything to you? <laughs> now, <laughs> that's right, the Protestants keep up, come on. Keep up. <laughs> Meanwhile, Trent is sitting with his disciples in a field in Glastonbury, giving them a talk. He has been allowed to come. I'm proud of you for all volunteering. It's a big one, it's gonna be fraught with danger. Let me tell you something. I have met the devil, mm -hmm. I have, in Wandsworth Arndale Shopping Centre <laughs> on a Wednesday afternoon. I was eating chips, she was buying video equipment, but I knew it was the devil, I felt the fear, it was the devil all right. The disciples sat around him, their eyes slightly glazed. Now it's the same glazed look that French teachers often find if they work in classrooms that are centrally heated. But just the students, oh. Because the disciples, they like that. They're happiest when they're doing things for Jesus, like singing songs like, um, he may have got holes in his hand, but he still packs a punch, right? That's, <laughs> that's their kind of song. But they had to listen to Trent for three hours. The last person you have to meet is Hillary. Hillary is my favourite. Hillary did not just say no. 
Hillary had said, gimme, 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 to every single illegal substance in the world. Right? She makes Keith Richard look healthy. <laughs> when Hillary dies, she wants to be cremated so local junkies can get stones standing downwind of the tomb. <laughs> A few years ago, Hillary was caught in possession of 20 grams of cocaine. The policeman who caught her thought it would be a really good move to actually sit her in the police cell and let her stew for a while, bring her in the interrogation room and let her stew for a while. So he left her there for two hours, came in with the cocaine, slammed it on the table and said, now you've got to think about a couple of things. Think about how long you're going to do inside, whether you can manage that stretch, whether you can do the time. You've got to think about that. And you've got to think about that before you ask yourself, Am I going to give this nice, kind policeman the name of my dealer? And he said this, staring out of the window, all rather nonchalantly and effectively, so he thought. Well, are you going to give me the name? He spun round to face her and the coke was gone. <laughs> every single gram, every single grain was gone. There's just an empty envelope. The forensics couldn't find a thing on it. He just went, uh, 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 uh. he realised what had happened. She'd snorted a lot. He's going, wh 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 how do you feel? Tired, she said, and fell asleep. <laughs> but she had paid the price, right? Her brain was now the consistency of potty putty, right? It was so burnt out that it was like a viscous liquid. So you could actually hear her brain glop and slop around if she moved quickly, right? Which means that if she moved really, really quickly, whole sections of her brain would merge into other sections of her brain. Right, so you'd actually have childhood memories. Suddenly, they'd actually be in the section of the brain that dealt with upper torso coordination. <laughs> Which meant having sex with Hillary was like sleeping with the entire cast of Apocalypse Now. <laughs> Her brain would just move from one section to another. So, for example, if she was at a party and she was working with the social manners section of her brain and suddenly it merged with the man part of her brain that could remember how to bake a pancake, she'd jump on the bar saying, whisk me in flour and eggs will flip me when I'm brown, and that was it. <laughs> She didn't have that many friends. <laughs> what she did know, though, was one thing, one thing for certain. She was a private detective, right? She was somehow a private detective. Somewhere along the line of reality and drugs and dream and burnt out brain, she had become a private detective and a spiritual detective to boot. A hippie private detective. <laughs> what well, was she actually doing at Glastonbury? Well, that's where she woke up, okay? <laughs> So that's our Hillary. Now, if God exists, and if God had an answer machine, the message he would have played back, oh, sorry, he, she would have played back, from Trent would be, beep. This is God, I'm out for the next millennium, so why don't you leave your prayer after the beep? Beep. <laughs> Hello, it's uh, Trent. The troops are out of sort. If, if, if Keith doesn't return to the base camp soon, I'll have to assume that he has deserted to the enemy. I will find him and I will get your combat jacket back for you, I promise you that. I will. And his soul. I will get his soul. As we handed out leaflets today, we were heckled by an eight-year-old. She said the F word lots of times. And she said, God, she said that you were an F word. And I know that you're all seeing and all knowing and that you heard and saw it all, so you know that she was possessed by demons. And I know, I knew she had to be saved because she was using the B word and the W word. We're all a bunch of Ws, that's what we were. We are Ws. So I picked her up and took her to our water barrel to baptise her, to cleanse her from the demons. She was struggling and she was calling us S's and A's. And I held her by the feet, head first over the holy water, your water, and then her, that's when her mother appeared with the Alsatians. <laughs> I'll be all right, though, with you by my side and, of course, some Savlon. <laughs> I'll be your soldier, God. Amen. Pete stood in the tent by the stall. He looked over his shoulder to make sure that they were alone. Oh, embarrassed or what? I mean, I can talk to you, but she, Judith, well, she, she put her finger up my bottom. When we were making love, I can't believe it. Obviously, we were making love, it wasn't in public. <laughs> she put her finger up my bottom, I couldn't believe it. The worst of it was, there was ointment, there was lubricant on her finger. It was premeditated. She had sat and thought, tonight when I make love to Pete, I'm going to stick my finger up his bottom. She had planned it, she had put the ointment within reach, undid the, undid the, the cap of it without me noticing it, and put the ointment on her finger. It was so cold. <laughs> 
such a shock. I'm, I just feel sick. I'm just, I'm just glad I can talk to you, that's all. You're the only person I can really talk to. Pete had not seen Hillary standing at the entrance of the tent. Hillary was standing watching him thinking, why is that man talking to a poster of Karl Marx? <laughs> But she'd actually had a little bit of a chat that day. Well, it was more of a vision. Hillary doesn't have chats, she has visions and dreams and happening, sort of spiritual tip-offs from her informers, yeah? And in her vision, I'll just very briefly describe the vision, she was holding a frying pan and a foot pump. Her father was a woodlouse, and he had napalm spurting from his ears. He was shouting, you've been talking about me again, look, they're burning. <laughs> you may find love or hate, it's up to you, you're on a mission. And then it got quite weird. <laughs> she was on a mission. She felt a lot better about that. Because she had actually spent all day in the green field. She'd been sitting there in dark sunglasses trying to hide the capillaries that were actually her eyes. And she sat there. Now, if she had the capacity to feel shame, she would have done. Because she had sat in the green field. Now, in the green field, there are mystics, palm readers, naked masseurs. There are herbalists who work solely with dock leaves. There are herbalists who work solely with nettles. There are macrobiotic cake bakers, there are mushroom cake bakers, there are healers, sealers, skin peelers, there's copper hoopers, there's new age brewers, and they're all there. They're existing, dancing, chanting, singing and praying, but most of all, they're making money. <laughs> and she'd set up a sign, Private Dick, mysterious crime solved in a mysterious way. She had not had one single customer. People laughed, someone said they'd lost their yang. <laughs> Someone offered her a bowl of soup and said, if you need to come around for a chat, you can do. <laughs> Yet she knew she was on a mission. She didn't know what on earth it was, but she was on a mission. She just hoped it had nothing to do with the woodlouse and the napalm and all the frying pan. She picked up her divining rod and headed for the bad vibes. Beep! Hello, it's Trent again. It's not going too, too well. I've lost Keith. I found his jacket by a caravan. But there was an station outside, so I didn't go in. <laughs> I just want to be strong. You know that I want to be strong for you, God. I just want to fight the devil if you'll let me. Amen. Now this is the point, right? Judith has had a very good festival. Every morning, Pete would go off to help clean up the rubbish around the festival site. He'd go and pick up rubbish around the site. Every morning, Judith would just go around picking up around the site. <laughs> Pete would sell at his stall, there'd be no nukes, his good nukes, there'd be t-shirts, there'd be all sorts of stuff, and Judith would get drunk and get very sort of like giggly and happy with friends, or people who were about to become extremely friendly. They would meet at about seven o'clock and argue by eight o'clock. By eight o'clock they're in separate parts of the, air, of, of the whole site. So Judith, on the final day, on the final evening, just as the sun is setting down there, and you know that beautiful feeling when the sun just sort of like tinges out this red glow and just sort of pulses underneath the grey underbellies of the clouds got quite poetic there. It was one of those evenings and the sun was just going down and you just feel comfortable. It's just like just about to be comfortable with the evening. It's like the last sigh before going to sleep. And Pete, well it was half past eight so he'd gone off to the world music stage to combat his latent racism and um, educate himself. He wasn't going to enjoy himself, that was for certain. Trent saw her. Trent saw Judith sitting outside the tent. And a glimmer of recognition and a glimmer of hope emerged that, oh God, I must fight the battle for you. Let me win just one soul. Just let me win just one soul for you, God. Let me overcome the devil and, uh, and uh, let me be a man for you. He approached the tent. May I sit down? Yes, you can, but you mustn't <laughs> say a single word about God or give me a leaflet. Huh? How did you... You've got God's stormtroopers written on the back of your jacket. Oh. <laughs> do you, um... Do you believe in... Uh, no, 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 no. Not a single word, OK? You can sit down, you can have a cup of tea, make you a cup of tea, but you're not to say anything about God. I can help you, said Trent. Judith looked at him. Now, that is a very interesting idea. I hadn't actually thought of the possibilities of this, of you actually fulfilling my needs, being a Christian brother, and suddenly Trent knew. Trent suddenly flipped into a mode of recognition. 
He stood up suddenly and said, I know, I know, the Wandsworth Armdale shopping centre, it's you, it's you. He was standing facing the devil. He picked up a huge stick and said, I will, I will conquer you, I will conquer the devil. Pete suddenly appeared, his music had not occurred because it was Glastonbury, the place was being run by hippies, it was five hours late. Right? <laughs> Pete suddenly appeared and saw Trent standing there holding a huge stick over Judith and said, Oh, I suppose this is another part of your sick game, is it? Hmm. What kind of trick is this one, is it? What are you going to do with the stick now? Well, if that's the way you're going to taunt me, that's just it. I'm off now and that's it. You can never see me again and I really do mean it. Hmm. And walked off. Leaving Judith. Just about to be struck by a huge stick by a madman called Trent. Trent standing there going, I will fight you, devil. I will have you, demon. I will destroy you, God. I will fight. I will win for you. And it was then that Hillary picked up the bad vibes. <laughs> she was standing next to Trent. But she picked up the bad vibes, came round enough, lifted up her sunglasses, the blood res eye glazed, and she injected him with a solution of God knows what. See, she certainly didn't know what on earth it was. But Trent slumped and fell to the ground. Beep! <coughs> <laughs> it's me again. <laughs> Trent. Oh. How's it going? Oh, oh it's all right down here, I think. If I could just keep the flamingos moving, I'm fine. <laughs> I don't need you, God. There we are, I told you. <laughs> I don't need you, and I don't need to be a man anymore. Jugglers, that's what I need. <laughs> jugglers. More jugglers. The more the merry, that's what I need. I don't need you. I don't need to be a man. I'm going to eat now. Amen. The last thing anyone actually heard Trent say before he died was, I don't care if that's how you use oregano or not. <laughs> Pete and Judith actually split up. The final word actually goes to Terry. Well, let me tell you this, it was quite odd at the end, right? Because I was working on the gate. Yeah, I was working on the gate, and it was one of the beautiful skies, dead dark, and the little stars beaming down on me. I like that a lot. And this woman, she came up to me. She came up to the gate, and I said, could I have your pass, please? And she lifted up her sunglasses, and by God, she had the most beautiful eyes I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> That's right, absolutely beautiful. She was holding this divining rod, and she just looked at me and said, it's you! It's you I'm after. Take me. I want your body. I said, oh, <laughs> blimey. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for that kind of commitment. <laughs> she said, I just said I wanted to sleep with you, not to have your children. <laughs> well, we've been together now for nearly a year. Next festival's coming up pretty soon. Sad it. We probably won't go. Good night. Mark Thomas. So, um, I just, in case anyone's wondering what happened to Trent after this, he's, it's okay, he's earning 50 grand a year at the moment designing sandwiches for British Rail. Good night. <laughs>